Hey everybody, welcome to our Sunday episode of Alex on Autos Live. Uh, wanted to apologize in advance if we have some bad streaming quality here. We are doing this uh, at my house this weekend, and my uh, internet connection here is not as speedy as it is at our office. I had hoped that this would be okay, but some early testing that we did uh, earlier this morning and later last night indicated that there may be a few streaming issues uh, that we hadn't anticipated. So if you're experiencing any of those streaming issues, I apologize in advance for that. Uh, let's just dive right into the questions here. Hopefully you're all seeing me okay out there. So uh, move up here to the top here. <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, how does the next-gen Highlander Hybrid get more horsepower than RAV4 when it uses the same engines? The difference in the new RAV4 Hybrid is going to be the battery pack. Um, the electric motors that are in uh, Toyota's hybrid systems can deliver quite a bit of power. Uh, the, the big limiting factor in most of that hybrid system design is really the battery not the electric motor so if the battery can dissipate more power can put out more energy than the battery pack in the RAV4 that's how we get to the higher total power outputs in something like the Highlander uh, now like the Toyota RAV4 once the battery is completely exhausted if you're climbing a really really long hill you'll notice that power will drop down to just what the engine can put out but uh, for most driving situations you'll have that that feeling of a peppier vehicle versus the RAV4 uh, let's move along here. <clears throat> Are the GDI engines from the Hyundai Motor Group plagued with the same problem, uh, carbon buildup problem, or have they filled out, figured out a solution? Um, that's a good question. Not all, not all gasoline direct injection engines seem to have the same carbon buildup problem. It does not seem to just be a, a direct injection thing for carbon buildup. It seems to be the way that the swirl inside the cylinder is designed. It seems to be uh, perhaps the way the, the crankcase ventilation systems are designed as well. So we don't seem to see that, that carbon buildup in all direct injection engines out there. There have been some issues with uh, the Volkswagen Group engines especially. There have been some mixed reports of Ford engines experiencing the problem, but not all of them. Um, and then... Honestly, a lot of what we've heard is more conjecture and rumor and the sky is falling uh, predictions rather than true um, scientifically repeatable problems. And I think the reason for that, unfortunately, is that we don't really have many years under our belt with these engines to really tell what's going to go on very long term. So is this going to be a problem in three to four, five years even? No, probably not. We don't see any evidence of that. But is it going to be a problem in 10, 15, 20 years? We just don't have enough data for that yet. Um, if you're really, really worried about that sort of buildup, then either don't get an engine with direct injection uh, or go get something like uh, the modern Toyota engines, which use direct injection and port injection at the same time. Something along those lines. Let's move along here. Uh... How good does the Tesla Model 3 auto lane change feature work? Have you tested it? Uh, I did test it, but only for a very brief amount of time. I have not spent as much time as Consumer Reports spent in that model. Our Model 3, we upgraded to autopilot to see how it would work, but it does not get the auto lane change feature. Uh, that's a differentiation between the Model 3s that are roaming around out there that have the full self-driving feature that people have paid for um, versus the base autopilot without those sorts of features. So... It, it, it ends up being the standard autopilot versus the enhanced autopilot, I think is how Tesla's defining it at the moment, if I recall correctly. And ours does not have the enhanced part, which would include the navigate on autopilot and the lane change feature. Um, now, the lane change feature definitely didn't feel um, normal, I guess I would say. But remember, that you're fighting the car with autopilot. So the autopilot is just an extreme form of lane keeping assistance. But you still have to have your hands on the steering wheel. So it's it's an awkward kind of feeling when you're driving along and you still have your hands on the wheel, but the car is doing all the work. Um, so a little bit difficult to talk about that. We didn't have too much experience there. I'll leave that to... I think Consumer Reports probably has a better handle on that than others at the moment. Uh, info on the Hyundai Venue, not yet, but hopefully we should hear some more soon. Uh, it's probably going to be launching towards the end of the summer, would be my guess. The Palisade... Um, was announced some time ago, and we're just going to be driving it next month in June. So it may be a little bit until we actually get our hands on the venue. Uh, let's see here. 
X3M or Stelvio Ti for the same price, BMW has more features. I would say it depends on what you're after. The Stelvio is going to be a bit more unique. It's a little bit, you know, less common, which is definitely an advantage to some folks out there. Um, I think the X3 is better rounded overall as far as, as hitting all of the all the points that you might want in a new vehicle at a relatively high level. But I don't think it's as fun as the Stelvio to drive. It doesn't feel quite as engaging. Um, on the other hand, it's probably going to be more reliable and less expensive to keep around, especially if you're thinking about purchasing it. So that's, a, that's an interesting twist there. Um, if it were me, I would probably get the BMW. Um, but that's just me. Let's see here. Are we done with all the Tesla Model 3 videos? Not sure you can handle another one. I think we might have just one more left, uh, perhaps two. There'll be obviously a wrap-up video when we get rid of it, when it finally sells. And then the secondary video will just be comparing the base infotainment system to what you get if you step up to the long-range models. So Standard Range and Standard Range Plus, um, they get the system without the satellite imagery, without the on-screen traffic, etc., uh, let's see here. Are what model year 2020 vehicle are you most excited about? I have to say at the moment, Eric, uh, that would probably be the Lincoln Aviator. I'm really intrigued to see what Lincoln is up to. Um, the Aviator is the Lincoln version, if you will, of the Ford Explorer. And the Ford Explorer and Lincoln Aviator are, are very different vehicles this generation than they were the last generation for the Explorer. They've gone rear wheel drive. They're considerably more powerful. We expect much better performance and handling out of them. And I'm particularly interested in the Aviator because by all appearances, it will have exactly what's needed for Lincoln to compete directly with BMW in that segment. And oddly enough, that is not what we see from Lexus or from uh, uh, Cadillac or from Genesis at the moment, because Genesis is missing a vehicle, if you will, and certainly not from Acura. So Lincoln will be the only manufacturer in this sort of next tier down in the luxury segment that is trying to do dynamically what BMW and Mercedes do. Um, and hopefully I'm not projecting too much onto the Aviator, but it's, it's also possible that the Aviator could be the better handling alternative to something like an Audi Q7, which would leave the the Mercedes-Benz uh, GL, GLE, the uh, X5, the three row versions of these two vehicles um, in direct competition with the Aviator as, as being the only 50-50 weight balanced rear wheel drive biased uh, luxury entry, something that even you don't find in the Volvo lineup. So I'm really intrigued to see how that goes. And also if it means a new direction for the Lincoln brand in America. And that's something we really don't know. Are they going to try and make uh, rear wheel drive sedans next? That would be intriguing. Um, but I do think that that bodes well for their, their future. Um, we are going to be driving the Cadillac XT6 at some point later this year, but the Cadillac XT6 is not going to be rear wheel drive. Cadillac really seems to have given up on rear wheel drive crossovers, leaving just their big SUVs and their sedans to be rear wheel drive. Uh, so moving along here, uh, with the rise of EVs, do you think biofuels have a future? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I haven't done much research on biofuels, to be honest. Uh, logically, biofuels definitely have a future. Um, whether or not we have the capacity, industrial capacity in the U.S. to to create enough biofuels to, to satisfy everybody, that's a different question. Uh, I know there were some early studies indicating that, that there's simply not enough arable land in the United States to satisfy um, the ethanol requirements, if everybody was going to run on ethanol, for instance. Um, so that's a little bit tricky. Uh, other studies have also indicated that there isn't enough arable land in the world to create enough biodiesel just to fuel America's needs, let alone the rest of the world's needs. Um, but it's probably still going to be a good balance in this process. The more more biofuels you blend into petroleum uh, sources, you know, from you know, ground ground pumped petroleum sources, the better one would logically assume, as long as the fuels could be done uh, cleanly, safely, um, and uh, and in a manner that's cost effective. That would really be the tricky thing here. Um, but the thing that would seal the deal most would be cost effectiveness. Americans and I think just gen worldwide drivers in general have indicated that. They're only interested in alternative fuels if it's cost effective to them. So uh, people will look at diesel vehicles if the diesel is is less expensive. They'll look at hybrids because they're less expensive to operate. 
they'll buy EVs largely because they're they're less expensive to operate. Um, and I think that will continue for for biofuels along along those lines. Uh, let's see here. What's better, Honda Odyssey or Chrysler Pacifica? Honestly, uh, Prince, I would say the Chrysler Pacifica. Um, I do like the Honda Odyssey, and there are definitely some reasons that you might want to get it. The top end trims do have the Honda 10 speed, um, as I recall. Someone I'm sure will correct me down there if I'm getting that wrong. Um, but uh, the big problem that I have with the, the Odyssey, um, with a few big problems actually, would be in theory, it's supposed to be a family friendly vehicle. So the Odyssey is supposed to be family focused, just like the Chrysler Pacifica. But you can't leave a child seat latched into the second row and tilt and slide the seats forward to get into the third row. And you can do that in the Pacifica. Um, the other problem I have with the Odyssey is for such a large and practical vehicle where they're selling it heavily on practicality, the magic second row seats that slide around and move in a bunch of different ways, when you remove them from the vehicle, they leave a huge hump uh, in that place where you could easily trip over it. Uh, but more importantly, you can't slide cargo up and over it. And if you're dealing with... Uh, if you're to try and put a sheet of drywall in your minivan or you're dealing with a school project and you're going and getting foam board or other things like that, then things are going to bend and possibly crack because there's this relatively sizable hump that the stuff is going to be laying on on one side. And we don't see that in the Pacifica. So I think it's just more practical all the way around. Um, and then on the Pacifica side as well, I would have to say that the hybrid is going to be my, my top pick there because it's quite simply gets 50% better fuel economy. Um, and that's a huge deal when it comes to a vehicle that we're talking about getting 20 miles per gallon or so, the Pacifica Hybrid is significantly more fuel efficient um, than the regular Pacifica, the Sienna, the Odyssey, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, although the Pacifica Hybrid does not get the folding, folding second row seats, the stone go seats, I think it still wins the practicality battle overall there. Um, and as with any plug-in hybrid, you also have the advantage of not visiting the gas station nearly as often. So in our recent testing of the Pacifica Hybrid, based on the ability that I had to plug it in on one side of my daily commute, the, uh, the gas tank would have lasted about 1,200 miles or so. So if you're interested in a vehicle um, and you don't want to go visit the gas station as often, that's going to be a really good choice there. Uh, let's see here. Any rumors on the next Gen GX? No, we haven't heard anything there yet. Uh, what do we think of the Chevy 1.5 liter turbo? Uh, I'm okay with it. We haven't spent too much time with it, honestly, just the in the Equinox. Um, so it, it proved to be a pretty good engine overall for that vehicle. Um, it's not as fast as some of the higher horsepower options in that segment, but overall it went well. Uh, any news on key improving the numbers of the Nero EVs in the U.S. either now or maybe in six months? Uh, as you indicated there, it's all about battery supply, according to Kia, and that's why the Kia Soul has been delayed in the United States, the Soul EV. Uh, there's simply not enough battery capacity in the world for all the EVs. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard those stories out there. Um, some of it is raw materials, and some of it is production line capacity. Um, even Tesla appears to be battery uh, production constrained in their factories. There's some infighting between Tesla and Panasonic about exactly whose fault it is. Um, but it does appear that there is a, a production constraint problem even at Tesla. Uh, this doesn't seem to have affected established EVs out there. So EVs that are currently in production like the Bolt and the Leaf and the Tesla models as much as the new EVs coming online because those existing EVs have had contracts for battery production schedules already. So even though production is constrained in a global manner, they've got those earlier contracts locked in. So they may not be able to build more units if they wanted to, but they can definitely build uh, the models that they had contracted there. So that's, that's what we see going on there. I don't know if it will be better in six months or not, but I do know that LG Chem and SK, as well as Panasonic outside of Tesla, have agreed or or, uh, or announced plans rather to expand their production capability. Um, I know that LG Chem and SK were planning on doubling or nearly doubling their production capacity over the next uh, few years. Now, how much of that will come online in six months, we don't know, but I expect that that's probably going to get sorted out soon. Uh, let's see here. If you purchase the XC90 T8 versus lease it, would I get the tax credit? Would I qualify for the pg and &E rebate? Yes. So um, I'm, since you're saying pg and &E, I'm assuming you're in California. So yes, uh, when you lease a vehicle or you buy a vehicle, you still qualify for uh, tax credits. Now, when you lease a vehicle, the leasing company is the one that qualifies for the tax credit on the vehicle from the federal government. That is the one important thing to keep in mind. 
So generally speaking, how this works is the lease payment will reflect the fact that that tax rebate has happened on the leased vehicle. Uh, now, the federal government's tax payment to leasing companies is not as large as it is to private entities. So if you're going to buy a vehicle that qualifies for a $7,500 tax credit, the EV may not, the EV leasing company may not get that full $7,500 uh, value from the federal government. It may be reduced in some capacity, so keep that in mind. But you will qualify for the California incentives, the PG&E incentives, etc. With the California incentives, you have to keep in mind that the car has to be uh, owned or leased by you for at least 30 months. Otherwise, California will come after you and try and get the, uh, the cash back. So keep that in mind. Don't sell it early. Uh, what are our thoughts on the kicks? Uh, I do like the kicks. Um, it's a really good value as far as base small crossovers go. It has some nice features. It has the autonom uh, automatic emergency braking um, as a standard feature. So if you're looking for some of those active safety features at the lowest price, that's going to be a good option. Uh, it's efficient. It's practical. It is not terribly swift. It does not handle as well as something like a CX-3 or a Kona. Um, but I think it's a good middle-of-the-road option. And if you're looking at the top end trim, you get the Bose personal audio system, which I think is really a, a unique twist as far as audio systems in expensive vehicles go. What Bose and Nissan did um, in, in that top end model was they created a surround sound system that works just for the driver. They have headrest speakers to give you that surround sound effect from the driver's perspective. But because it's an inexpensive vehicle, just the driver gets that feature. So there's, there's, um, Less, fewer electronic components going on, <coughs> fewer speakers, fewer components, etc., versus giving that surround sound ability to the whole car. So it helps give you that premium feature at a lower price. Um, let's see here. Hey, Sammy. Uh, someone wants a shout out, so there we go. Hi, Sammy. Uh, Taylor's asking, I've heard the Volkswagen that says a lot of electrical issues. Do you think it would be a safe buy or would you pass on it? Um, I, that's a kind of a tricky thing. I do understand that the Volkswagen Atlas has had some reliability problems. Volkswagen in general is not the most reliable brand in America. If you want reliable brands, you look at Toyota first, um, then you look at the Korean brands and Honda second. So Honda, Kia, and Hyundai seem to be on fairly equal footing as far as short-term and mid-range reliability goes. Long-term reliability, we don't, we don't know the exact metrics yet. Um, and then you would look at American third, and strangely enough, you would generally look at European sort of last. Um, but that said, the Volkswagen Atlas has a lot of things going for it. It's absolutely enormous on the inside, and it's very child-friendly. It also has some gadgets that we just don't find in the competition. So if you want the LCD instrument cluster, if you want the uh, the bigger touchscreen in the dashboard, um, those are features that we find in the Atlas that we don't find in the competition. The second row seats that allow us to keep three child seats latched into place and tilt and slide forward to get into the third row, that's also something that we don't see in the competition either. We see seats in the CX-9 and in the Pathfinder, for instance, that will let you keep one child seat latched into place, but just on the 40% folding side, not on the entire bench. So the Atlas is very, very family practical, and I would have to say if, if that's your, your goal and that's what you're looking for, then I would say those considerations, for me at least, would outweigh any potential reliability problem that could be fixed under warranty. And the Atlas does have a long manufacturer's bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, so if you're concerned about that, that may help allay some of your fears, but it could still be a pain if you had a problem there. Uh, S65 AMG review. I'm going to go ahead and say, Leon, that we're probably not going to get an S65 anytime soon, but you never know. Mercedes might like us one day and, and throw one at us. Um, let's see here. Is the Honda Pilot good? Do we have any problems? Should he buy it? Um, Juan, I would say that the Honda Pilot has been a good performer overall, but I would say keep in mind that that 9-speed automatic transmission is a little bit of a, uh, a mixed bag, so be sure if you're looking at the top end trims of the Honda Pilot, spend a good amount of time driving one, get a dealer that will let you take some time driving it around, and see if you can really uh, live with that way that 9-speed automatic shifts. I think that will really end up determining how you feel about it long term. Uh, let's see here. Uh, try to help is saying in his experience, uh, carbon buildup has been caused by high PCV flow. Um, that is true. That's something that we've noticed a lot here too. So it's like, like I said, it depends on the way that the system has been designed. So if you're getting a lot of crankcase ventilation, 
um, <clears throat> if you're getting a lot of, <clears throat> and, and, and this is coupled with blow by too. So if you're if you're a if your engine has been designed in a way where there there is is more blow by um, from the combustion chamber into the crankcase, then you're going to be getting more stuff thrown from the crankcase area and then sucked into um, the intake and then deposited on the valves. So again, it definitely seems to be an engine design thing, not specifically gasoline direct injection. So whether different engine designs out there are prone to that problem or not isn't something that we can tell right away, especially if it's a newer engine. It's something that you do have to wait a while. You have to wait a few years to see if it's going to build up. Um, but it isn't necessarily tied with direct injection engines. And manufacturers, now that they're very aware of the problem, definitely seem to be, at least uh, according to them, seem to be spending more time trying to address those issues beforehand. So uh, we'll we'll be able to tell there in a, in a while. Let's see here. Uh, which Mercedes GLE suspension would I get? Standard, air, or E-Active? I have to say, I would probably stop at the air suspension. The E-Active suspension is totally cool. It's absolutely crazy. Um, and if you want to make your GLE dance at the stoplight, it's it's entertaining. Um, but I don't think I need an $8,000 suspension that will help me get out of the sand. Totally cool. One of the coolest features I have seen that I have played with. I spent some time in one uh, in Seattle recently, and it was a, it was an absolute hoot, hilarious. Um, but I don't think that I actually need it, so hopefully that helps you there. Uh, Maz is probably the only manufacturer using a six-speed transmission. Are they missing the boat? I love my CX-5 signature, but fuel economy could be better. Uh, so, Paul, yes, that is definitely one thing that I have noticed about Mazda's product line lately. Um, the big reason that Mazda uses that six-speed automatic transmission is simply that it's been paid for for a very long time. Uh, the six-speed transmission is a Ford design originally, so it was a four-speed, then it was a five-speed, now it's a six-speed. Um, the long and short of it is the design's been paid for for a very long time. Mazda apparently is not paying any licensing fees. Ford sold that when they sold Mazda. Uh, it's being built in a Mazda factory. so. The sunk costs on the transmission unit itself are very low, and now they just have production costs to cover. Um, and they've tweaked it here and there. They've put, you know, beefier clutch packs on the torque converter so that we can spend more time in lockup to try and improve overall efficiency. But I do think that the six speed is a stumbling block for them for a few reasons. Um, it doesn't have the same ratio spread that we find in the competition's eight speed automatics and nine speed automatics, 10 speeds, etc. So that means that acceleration is a bit muted versus the competition and overall top end fuel efficiency isn't going to be quite as good because you can't have as high of a final gear. Um, Mazda compensates for this in a wide variety of different ways with all of their other fuel saving technologies. Uh, but as a very small auto company, uh, Mazda definitely does seem to have a more limited budget to throw at some of these things than other companies do. Um, and then the second thing that I've noticed that's a problem uh, as a result of that six-speed design is that there's not a lot of room in the engine bay for Mazda's vehicles. Uh, the six-speed transmission is physically very large and very heavy, and that does put more weight up front in their vehicles, and it reduces the the uh, what you can do in the engine bay. So uh, let's move along here. Will the new BMW 3 Series have a manual transmission? That's not something that we really know yet. I wouldn't be surprised if they had manual transmissions in Europe, whether or not they will ever come to the US. That's a different question. Uh, I would say it's probably a 50-50. Uh, let's see here. Why are VWS and SE Golf so rare in inventories? Uh, I would say because generally the Golf doesn't sell terribly well in the United States and uh, they are moving over to the new engine design for 2019, so that could have something to do with it as well. They're probably prioritizing some of their better selling products. Uh, has the current generation Explorer been fairly reliable? Uh, I think overall it's been okay. Um, if you look at the reliability metrics, it may not be as reliable as the Highlander, but it does seem to be posting better reliability metrics than something like the Volkswagen Atlas. Um, moving along here. My mom currently has a 2018 Sportage SX, needs a bigger trunk for her standard poodle. Not necessarily third row. Am I wrong in recommending an accurate RDX? Uh, son in the second row too. Um, the RDX will have a bigger cargo area than the Sportage, but if you're looking for something that's that's um, a real next step above the Sportage's cargo area, I would probably go for something bigger. Remember that the RDX, although it does have an accommodating trunk, 
is still a compact crossover. So if you want a bigger cargo area, you need to move up to the next size category. So something like the Chevy Blazer, the Passport, the Santa Fe, Grand Cherokee, um, the Ford Edge, the Nissan Murano, etc. That category in the two row segment, that would be where you would find considerably more space. So uh, we have the Honda Passport this week actually up in the driveway. And the Passport, for instance, has 41 and a half cubic feet, I believe it is, storage space behind the second row. So that is about double what we see in the Sportage SX, roughly. Um, and then if you slide the second row seats forward, which will reduce the legroom for the person in the second row, mind you, uh, you'll get over 50 cubic feet of storage space behind the second row. So if you want that next level in storage space, the Passport is going to be uh, really big and accommodating in the back, but not as big as a three row with a third row folded. So the Honda Pilot will give you a little bit more room. Uh, so if you're not looking for something as large as a Pilot or a Highlander, etc., then that that middle, that tweener category is probably going to be where you want to go. Um, or something like a smaller three-row crossover like a uh, Kia Sorento might not be a bad option. Um, the uh, Volkswagen Tiguan is actually not quite a tweener. It's a, just a big compact crossover, but it's going to have more room behind the second row seats somewhere along those lines. Uh, let's move along here. Honda HRV or Nissan Kicks. I would say my first instinct would be Honda HRV. I think it just is a little bit more harmonious on the inside, even though it's not exactly a spring chicken. Um, but between in that category, I would say if you aren't needing front wheel drive, or sorry, aren't needing all wheel drive, I would probably just get the uh, the Kia uh, Soul. Um, the Soul, there's a reason that the Soul is the best selling vehicle in that segment. Whether you put the Soul in the compact crossover segment or whether you just call it a subcompact whatever, the Soul is the best selling thing in America. Um, and I think it's rational because it's very practical, it's roomy on the inside, has a decent cargo area, etc. Um, if you need all wheel drive, then I would say it depends on your priorities. If you're looking at the inexpensive side of things, the HRV is going to be a really great buy. Um, but if you want to spend a little bit more, oddly enough, I would really look at the Buick Encore. It gives you a better warranty. There's a, there are pretty good deals on the hood of the Encore. Um, and overall, it's a well put together, practical crossover. And it's going to give you a more premium feel uh, in that segment without, without being too, too much. Um, so I think I might look at that one as well. Uh, why isn't GM using Super Cruise on more models and also hybrids on more models like Toyota and Lexus? Um, I think the, the easiest way to explain GM and Super Cruise, just like Toyota, Lexus, and hybrids, um, is that General Motors and Toyota are both relatively conservative car companies. And GM is definitely erring on the side of caution with Super Cruise. It's a feature they definitely believe in and they're spending a lot of money on, but um, General Motors has a healthy fear of being sued. And I've said this before, this is my one thing with autopilot and Tesla's full self-driving claims that I would, I would keep in mind if I were a shopper in the market. I don't think, and this is controversial, mind you, I don't think that GM cares more about you as a customer um, than anybody else does, or Tesla cares about you as a customer. But I think that General Motors has a healthier fear of being sued because of their long history as a car manufacturer. They've been around a long time. They've been sued a lot. I think General Motors has a healthier fear of being sued than Tesla does. And I think that's really why I would trust the self-driving technologies from other car companies before I would trust them from Tesla. Um, because, again, not because I think that they care more about my safety as a customer, but because they're going to be more likely to thoroughly vet these technologies and, and thoroughly explain what they do and what they don't do versus what Tesla tries to do. Uh, I think that the Consumer Reports uh, are, you know, recent release about Tesla's autopilot system and, and their, their thoughts on it changing lanes and, and how that feels, etc., I think is a good example. Um, after having experienced it, like I said, a limited time in Virginia, it definitely doesn't drive like you or I would drive a car. It's not as smooth. Um, the lane changes do seem a little bit abrupt. Now, in our sh short time with it, it didn't cut anybody off. It didn't create that kind of problem. Um, but it definitely doesn't drive the way you and I would drive. Um, and whether or not that is a safety problem, 
I can't say at the moment because we don't have enough experience with it. But I, I can say that Super Cruise is a very different kind of system. Uh, General Motors is making sure that you're paying attention. So even though you have to have your hands on the wheel with the Tesla system for autopilot to work, you can be far, far more distracted with autopilot than you can with Super Cruise. If you have autopilot on and you grab your cell phone and you're hanging onto the steering wheel and you're texting along, um, autopilot will just trundle right along and run you into a semi uh, or into a wall or whatever, or disengage and, you know, you have to take over. Um, Super Cruise, if your eyes are on the phone for more than a few seconds, it'll start beeping at you and then it will disengage. Um, again, I think it's the liability thing there. Um, with Toyota and Lexus and the hybrids, I think that's a slightly different thing. Um, Toyota is very interested in profitability and they really dislike models that are intrinsically unprofitable. They will have a few vehicles now and then they'll, they'll push as, um, technology experiments like the Mirai, the very, very first Toyota Prius, but they will generally have a plan to make money on them long term. If it's, especially if it's something that they're investing a lot of R and D money into, and I think at the moment with hybrids, they're waiting till the synergies are right for profitability to push out more of those hybrid models. Uh, let's see here. Do we agree with Cadillac repositioning the CT4? And do you think the interiors will finally be worthy? Um, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the interiors and whether they're worthy. Honestly, I don't find a problem with the ATS, CTS, and CT6 interiors, um, or the XT4 or XT5 interiors necessarily. Um, I know there has it's it's a common theme in reviews to to diss Cadillac interiors and say that they're somehow lesser than, um, but I don't find Audi interiors in their base models particularly nicer places to spend your time. And especially for comparably priced vehicles, when you look at what the actual transaction prices are going for, I think the Cadillacs are just fine. They do share parts with other GM vehicles, and I don't find that a particular problem either. Volkswagen and Audi share parts. Mercedes and Dodge still share parts. My Dodge Durango has the same window switches that you find in Mercedes-Benz E-Class. Um, it still has the same uh, stocks on the steering wheel that we find in some of the older Mercedes-Benz models as well. Um, so I don't, I don't find part sharing to be a particular problem. Um, so I, I don't really think that that's a, a particular issue. And then as far as reducing their sedan lineup, that does seem to make logical sense right now because sedan sales are not great and Cadillac sedans especially haven't sold particularly well. So if it's the choice of not having a sedan at all, um, or having a sedan that's a rebadged Malibu versus a, you know, maybe two, a rebadged Malibu and a rebadged whatever, in their lineup, then I'll take the one rear wheel drive sedan that's a Cadillac over that alternative. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, let's see here. Are body on frame vehicles more structurally rigid than a comparable crossover? Um, generally speaking, no. Um, the one thing about unibodies is that they, it, they tend to improve rigidity. And that's why we see a lot of off-road vehicles uh, that are unibodies. So for instance, depending on the generation you're looking at, uh, certain generations of the Pathfinder, um, have been unibody vehicles. Uh, the Grand Cherokee has long been a unibody vehicle for that exact reason. So compared to the Wagoneer, which the Grand Cherokee replaced effectively in their lineup once upon a time, the big reason they went to unibody was for that structural rigidity. You can make sure that the frame and the body and everything that is the vehicle uh, moves in a more predictable manner than a body on frame would, where the frame can have flexation, the body can have flexation, and they can be flexing differently from one another. Now, there are always pros and cons with body on frame versus unibody. Um, and my Dodge Durango is a perfect example of, of these trade offs. So, the Durango has excellent towing ability. It has uh, decent off road ability compared to other large crossovers like that. Um, it could tow over 8,000 pounds if you get the right model. But on the downside, when you're towing those heavier weights, the very fact that the frame and the body are one piece causes the interior to be much louder than something like a Chevy Tahoe or a Sequoia uh, or a QX80 or something along those lines. Uh, because when the frame and the body are isolated from one another, the body can be quieter. Uh, you get less vibration from the drivetrain, you get less vibration from the road, and you have less vibration from a trailer rattling around on its hitch. So there are definitely pros and cons to, to each side of this. Now when it comes to uh, crash tests on SUVs, 
that is a little bit trickier. So remember that a lot of these body on frame SUVs are older in terms of overall design. So they have not been designed for the small offset crash test, especially. Um, and the small offset crash test is going to rely on in, in a lot of those vehicle designs on the body a little bit more than the frame. So in, in full on head on crash, that's where your, your full body is impacting the barrier those tend to rely more on the frame and how the frame is going to dissipate energy through the vehicle. There's a little bit of coordination between the body and the frame and how those, those crash loads are being distributed and what's being done with them. But when we're talking about small offset crashes, then the frame is not as involved. It's the body. And, and did those original designs account for those crash test metrics? And the answer is probably no for the vast majority of them. Uh, but when we look at some of the newer body-on-frame SUVs, like the the new uh, explore the new Expedition, the new uh, Navigator, etc., those do seem to perform better in those uh, offset crash tests than previous designs. So I would say I would I would probably bet that the next generation Tahoe and Suburban and Yukon and Yukon XL and Escalade are going to do much better in those small offset IHS crash tests. Um, than at the moment. Um, let's see here. And that actually brings me along to uh, our some, some additional questions here on the Tesla Model 3. I know that I've gotten a lot of questions about safety and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, comments on our recent Model 3 videos where people say, well, yeah, but what about the safety? What about the safety? Um, it's very important when you're looking at safety ratings to compare A, only within the same segment. So when they're crash testing vehicles, the IHS and NHTSA, neither of these organizations is saying that a five-star um, rated Honda HRV is going to be as safe as a five-star rated Honda Pilot, especially if you crash the two vehicles into one another. So crash tests are not applicable in that manner. So when we're taking a look at uh, large vehicle on small vehicle, keep that in mind. The other thing is that when we're taking a look at some of these numbers, uh, they're not being done by the same agency. So Tesla did unquestionably perform very, very well on the Model 3 test. Even though NHTSA tried to walk back Tesla's claims and say, well, we don't judge whether or not a vehicle is the safest ever. Uh, by the raw numbers, we do know, however, that the Model 3 did perform uh, better than any of the other vehicles that have tested recently in those actual load metrics. Uh, oddly enough, the Ford Mustang was second, so go figure. Um, but on the flip side, the IAHS has yet to test the Model 3, and the IAHS testing is very different. They test at different speeds, they're different styles of tests, they're pull tests, rear end tests for neck loads and whiplash, uh, they're the offset test, the small offset test, etc. And so we don't know how the Model 3 performs in any of those tests because it hasn't been tested yet. But we do know that some of the other competitive EVs out there have been tested in the IAHS tests, and those vehicles receive top safety pick plus. Uh, but then they've not been tested by NHTSA. So which one is safer? We absolutely cannot say because they have not been tested on the same test. So until all of these vehicles have been tested on all of the various tests out there, it's just not something that we can say with, with uh, certainty uh, or safety either there. So um, I wouldn't have a problem with any of the modern crop of EVs out there that have been crash tested and received good marks in either of these tests. But... I will say that personally, I put more faith in the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's testing than NHTSA because of the expanded uh, style of their testing, the speeds involved, and just their, their methodology and the way they do measurements. Um, they put more emphasis on, on loads in different areas of the body than the NHTSA test does. Um, there are some NHTSA testing profiles where things like leg loads and shin loads are not calculated the same way. So I would put more, more emphasis on the IHS testing. Uh, let's see here, move in here. Uh, Russell saying, but the Pacific Hybrid doesn't have the seats that fold on the floor, so then it's not that practical again. That's true, Russell, but then I would argue that the 50% better fuel economy and significantly lower operating costs would then factor into that, that decision-making process for me there. Um, and I would say it's not particularly a, a flaw in the Pacifica Hybrid because that just puts the Pacifica Hybrid on the same practicality level as all of the other car companies out there. So if you look at the Sienna uh, and the Odyssey, 
Uh, they don't have removable, they don't have fold into the floor second row seats. Those seats have to be removed from the vehicle. So even though it's no longer a selling advantage for the Pacifica, it's not really a disadvantage because it just means it's the same as, as the other options there. Uh, Honda Ridgeline, is it a good option for family outdoor trips? Uh, I've said this before, I think that the Honda Ridgeline is all the truck that that 95% of Americans need, but strangely enough, not really what seem, people seem to want. So the Ridgeline is an excellent truck, it's very practical, it's fuel efficient, it's comfortable, it's safe, etc. But it just doesn't seem to be as sexy, for the lack of a better word, as an F-150 or a Silverado or a Ram 1500. Um, which I think is a pity because the Ridgeline, I think, deserves a much bigger share of that market than it actually has. And I really hope that other manufacturers try to create um, trucks that are along the lines of the Ridgeline to satisfy those particular needs. So moving along here, uh, Ray Model 3 or Honda Accord Hybrid. I would say that depends on what you're looking for. Remember that the Model 3 is considerably smaller on the inside. Uh, let's see here. Genesis said the new G80 would be announced in September in Korea. Do you believe it's possible the GV80 would be announced at the same time? Uh, Philippe, we don't really know. For some reason, Genesis has been pretty behind on their SUVs. We, we haven't really seen too many of the prototypes running around. We've seen some of the very, very early mules where, where there's the body of a Hyundai or a Kia on top of something that's rear-wheel drive. So we don't know where those products are. Um, one thing that we can say is that Hyundai and Genesis seem to really be taking their time on that. So Genesis has said that this is a, a long-term plan. They don't plan on rushing products to market. Um, what does that mean? We don't really know. Uh, let's move along here. Kendall, first stream. What's going on here? It's a random question stream. Uh, moving along here. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Um, Lucina is asking, when do you think Mazda's new infotainment system will move to other models in the lineup? Um, that is a good question. Probably not until they've been redesigned. Uh, Mazda has said that that system is more integrated into the vehicle than some of their other cars. So I would expect that their other vehicles are going to have to wait till a mid-cycle refresh to actually get it. Best bang for the buck to drive, compact, excluding top, top priced versions like the Type R GTI. I would say that the regular turbocharged Honda Civic is an excellent option there. It's an awful lot of fun. It's uh, easy to live with, etc. If you can handle the overall styling. If you're not a huge fan of the styling, then I would say something along the lines of perhaps the Volkswagen Jetta is actually pretty fun to drive. Um, but the, the Honda Civic, I think, is just a, a great all-around option in the turbocharged version. When can we expect a review on the Volkswagen uh, Arteon? That's probably going to be coming up in about the next two months or so. Hopefully we'll have our hands on one soon. How good or bad is the Dodge Caravan, Mark? Uh, that is an interesting question. I'm interested how you, I'm surprised how you, uh, I'm interested in how you describe that. Um, the caravan is old. It's very, very old. Uh, I recently had one in Mexico um, driving along, so we spent a few days there driving a Dodge Caravan, and it, it's some cheap minivan. Um, if you are looking for a people hauler that will, honest to goodness, carry seven people and is very practical, um, and you don't care too much about some of the details, then the caravan is an excellent option. It is crazy cheap. You will get a caravan significantly cheaper than a Sienna, an Odyssey, a Pacifica, etc. And that really seems to be the reason that, that uh, FCA has kept the caravan around. Now, you won't find any modern features in it. You won't find CarPlay. You won't find Android Auto. You won't find a new navigation system. Um, any of those new luxury, semi-luxury features, whatever you want to call them, you won't find their more comfortable second row seats. The second row seats are a little on the uncomfortable side. Um, lots of hard plastics, all that kind of stuff, all going on in the caravan. But it is really cheap. In fact, if we look up Grand Caravan here, let's see how cheap they go right now. So you can get a caravan for... Uh, under $20,000 for a brand new one, which is pretty damn cheap. So uh, if you're looking for that cheap thing, that is definitely going to be where you want to go. If you're looking for any of the creature comforts, then I would I would go look for something else. But it's not bad um, when you when you factor that it out. Uh, a pity of the new BMW X5. We actually have a full video on that one, Andrew. So if you are on our channel, just look for the X5 video. Uh, it's not too old. Um, 
Let me actually double check that because I could be telling a lie here. It may actually be going live next week. So let's look and see what's up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry about that. The X5 video is not live yet. It is actually going up next week. So I will just put a, uh, a shareable link here in the comment section and you can click on over to that early. Uh, but expect that X5 video to be up maybe Wednesday. So coming up next week, we have the Volkswagen Jetta full review, the BMW X5 full review, a quick video on the Gladiator versus the Ford Ranger off-road edition. Um, and then we have the Kia Soul coming up uh, shortly thereafter. We're also going to have a few Tesla videos wrapped into there, one on infotainment, one on our wrap-up getting rid of the, uh, the Tesla. And big news, we will have a first drive review on our new long-term Hyundai Nexo coming up very soon. Uh, we will have that one for three years, and we're going to be picking it up in Los Angeles on Saturday. So videos on that coming up soon. And uh, then we will have a wrap-up video on our Kia Soul EV. It's the 2016 model that we've had for three years, and now it's going off into the sunset. And hopefully a one-year wrap-up on the Dodge Durango that we have as well. So moving along here, Anthony, thanks for coverage on the Tesla Standard Range. Reviews helped me decide last week. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Handling is stiff. See, I'm, I'm not the only one who thinks that the ride is a little bit stiff in the Model 3. Um, congratulations on the new car. I have to say, I, I'm th this always boggles my mind because um, <clears throat> Model 3 fans, Tesla fans in general, are just an interesting group of people. Um, <clears throat> if you put out a video on a Tesla, <clears throat> you will get the Tesla fans that think that you have, have never said anything nice about a Tesla in your life. And then you will get the Tesla haters that think that Tesla can do absolutely no nothing right, that they're they're terrible vehicles. <clears throat> and that's neither of these things is really true. Um, personally, I think the Model 3 is a great vehicle. Does it get everything right? Absolutely not. What new car does? Um, but it is unquestionably uh, a good handling vehicle. It's unquestionably efficient. Uh, the range is good. The charging process is good. I really love the purchasing process, actually. Uh, buying one without ever seeing a dealer. I clicked on it from home. The car arrived. I signed for it. I never had to visit anybody. Uh, I loved that process. Um, but does Tesla get everything right? Absolutely not. There, there are definitely um, quirks with it. I hate the single screen thing. I think two screens would have been way more sensible. I hate the fact that I can't move the vents with my fingers. I think that's just stupid. Um, I wish it had a moonroof. I just wish it didn't have the, uh, the full glass roof. Um, but overall, it's still a good solid vehicle, and it's a really good deal for $35,000 if you can get your hands on one of those. So, there are my thoughts on that. Uh, what's the story between the new Mazda 2 liter supercharged on the Model 3? I believe you mean the, uh, the uh, Mazda 3. Um, we'll see that uh, shortly. We will know more about it probably in about 6 to 9 months. Let's put it that way. Uh, have you heard when the Volkswagen ID3 is going to be available? Uh, don't expect that for about a full calendar year. So a lot of the EVs that we're hearing about now, if you really look at them, their on-sale date is pretty far out there. The Model Y, uh, they're saying that's going to be late next year, and then even further out if you want the Model 3, the Model Y with three rows. Um, Kia Soul EV even announced for quite some time. That's delayed till 2020. The Polestar 2, again delayed. Volvo's battery electric vehicle delayed. Um, don't expect good supplies of the Jaguar I-Pace for quite a while as well. Definitely keep those in mind. And then the Volkswagen series of, of battery electric vehicles, those they seem to be targeting late 2020, early 2021. So it's going to be a while. Uh, Melanie's uh, saying that she's trying to decide whether she should get a three-row crossover. I don't carry around children. Uh, I do hold a lot of luggage and other things as well as people from the office when they do carpools. Um... I'm assuming you're saying you're debating between a two-row and a three-row crossover. Uh, I, I like the thought of the three-row crossover, to be perfectly honest. That's part of why we ended up with the Durango that we got, because in my head, the third row as an emergency device seems pretty handy. And I think that over a year of ownership, we have used the third row twice. Uh, one for a work lunch where we wanted to take everybody in one car... So that was one time shortly after we got it. And then um, my parents were visiting at some point right after we got it. 
and we fit everybody in the vehicle at that time as well. Now, unfortunately, the Durango seats six, not seven, so now it's no longer a good option because I have a nephew, so uh, that doesn't work. Um, but they they can be handy, so you know I I, I understand your dilemma there. Um, I would say if you're debating, you might as well get one. You never know when you might use it, um, especially if you need the cargo capacity that they provide. If you're taking a look at something like a Santa Fe or a Passport, um, the three-row crossover segment is not that much bigger, that much, that, not that much less efficient than those two options. So going from Santa Fe to Palisade, going from Passport to Pilot, um, going from Edge to Explorer, it's, it's not a huge leap in terms of loss of fuel economy, but you do gain that extra practicality. And if you don't mind the, the image that a three-row crossover projects, uh, then I would say it's, it's, it's going to be an easy win for the three-row crossover. Um, bearing in mind that a lot of people do shop on vehicles because of the image that they project, and that's why, even though minivans are very practical, a lot of people will say, well, I'll just jam everybody into the three-row crossover instead. So I, I completely understand uh, that right there. Um, <clears throat> SSR is asking, uh, which car or sportback do you prefer, the Regal GS or the Arteon? That's a tricky one. I think I like the styling of the Arteon better, but I like the power in the Regal GS better. But I personally would not choose either of those. I would probably get something like the uh, Stinger, because the Stinger has almost as much room in the back as the Regal GS, but significantly better performance because of the rear-wheel drive layout. Um, so if you're looking at something along those lines, that's where I would go. Um, if you're looking at the Regal GS or uh, Arteon, I would probably say... Um, something like a Chrysler 300 might not be a bad deal either. The V8 rear wheel drive layout, big trunk, etc. Not going to have the practicality of the sport back, but that might not be a bad option there. Um, that's my thought there. Let's see here. So Chad is saying, my wife and I will soon be on the market for a vehicle. I'd like a Toyota or Honda in all wheel drive, but they're out of my price range. Uh, how is long term reliability for companies like Hyundai and Kia? Uh, that's a good question. So like I said earlier, long term reliability is something that we don't know. Um, and the reason I will say it that way is that Hyundai and Kia have made great strides in terms of overall reliability and dependability, uh, and that's one of the reasons that they've overall impressed me. If I if I do have to say, if I had to say, if I had to pick one company that's impressed me most in their determination to make an impact, it, it is that conglomerate, the Hyundai Kia conglomerate, because they really seem to be laser focused on things. And, and and seem to make changes faster than other car companies do. And one of those big changes has been reliability. So when we look at short-term reliability metrics, one to three years, we, we see that, that Hyundai and Kia have managed to match or beat Toyota in terms of overall reliability in these shorter-term metrics. Now, how does that translate to longer-term metrics? We really don't know because in the longer-term metrics, we're looking at previous generations of products that also scored lower in the short-term metrics, if that makes sense to you. So we don't know whether the short-term metrics are a harbinger of long-term metrics or not, but um, I would say that I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be afraid of getting one of those products for a long-term ownership situation uh, because they have proven themselves uh, dependable in the short term. Um, I would say in those longer-term metrics at the moment, I might be more concerned about Honda because Honda has had a long tradition of reliability and dependability, but they've had a number of stumbles lately, which I'd say have actually been surprising to me. Uh, for instance, their recent recall of um, about a million of their 1.5 liter turbo engines. Um, that honestly surprised me that we didn't find out some of those problems a little bit earlier. They weren't corrected a little bit earlier in the pipeline. Um, they've also had some issues uh, with their, their older five-speed automatic transmissions. Um, the 9-speed automatic transmission, we can't blame directly on Honda. It's a ZF unit, but Honda did choose it for the vehicles. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't have any particular concerns with them in terms of overall reliability. Um, but I would also say if you're looking for for the one that is, is most likely going to give you the best long-term reliability, that's still probably going to be Toyota. If, if someone came to me and said, reliability is my number one concern, what should I get? Without question, at the moment, you should get a Toyota because they're most likely going to give you what you're after there. Let's put it that way. Um, 
the way way inner channel is saying please comment on carbon build up a modern gdi engines and how's it compared to those of the Toyota d4s system uh, if you go back earlier in this video we talked a lot about that um, it seems to mainly be on engine design rather than injection system design so again it's it's not just uh the combustion going on inside the cylinder that's causing carbon buildup. A lot of this is crankcase ventilation. So it's it's how when when the gap when the explosion happens inside the cylinder when you're burning the fuel, some of that goes down past the rings into the crankcase. There's oil wandering around in there. Um, you know the oil uh, sloshing around with these gases. Uh, some of that comes up through the top through the crankcase ventilation system, and then will go into the intake and build up on those carbon uh, build those carbon deposits up on the valves. Um, what portion is responsible for what? We we don't have good handles on necessarily for every engine type out there. Um, some studies have really pointed the finger at the crankcase gases. Some have pointed figure, fingers at, at incomplete burning inside the cylinder, that that's where things are going wrong. It could be a combination of both and most likely is, but it definitely seems to affect some engine designs more than others. So Toad is very cautious on this. So they have the port injection and the direct injection for a variety of reasons. One of those is carbon buildup. But Toyota has also said that one of the other reasons they use that system is because in some uh, performance profiles, port injection provides better a better power efficiency balance than direct injection does. And so they will use a mixture as a result, but it costs a little bit more. Um, so which one is, is better long-term for that is a little unsure. D4S is going to probably have the better better long-term metrics, however. Um, is the CX-5 the best compact SUV in the market now? What do you suggest about the original tires? Uh, I do like the CX-5 Turbo an awful lot, but is it the best? And that depends on what you want out of your crossover. So if you're looking for bigger cargo capacity, um, better seating in the rear, that sort of thing, then something like a Honda CRV is going to be a good option. If you're looking for the best fuel economy, that would be something like the RAV4 Hybrid. Uh, if you're looking for the best value in terms of uh, base price, that would be something like the Subaru Forester all-wheel drive. Um, so it, it really depends on what exactly you're after there. Uh, but if you're looking at specifically more performance-oriented models, the CX-5 Turbo is definitely an excellent option there. And I would probably go for something along the lines of a 245 tire, as long as they could fit. I haven't been able to do any research into what will fit on there without rubbing, so you're going to have to do some research on your own there. Um, but just make sure that you try and find a tire that has the same rotational diameter as the original tire. There's some online calculators that will help you with that. Uh, you want to make sure that the odometer and the speedometer are roughly correct. So you want to stay as close as possible to that. Moving along here, uh, buying a new 2019 RAV4 or used 2016 BMW 2 Series. That is quite a spread there. Uh, I, I don't know. It, gets, it would depend on exactly what you're after. Uh, do we think the next generation Tacoma, maybe there'll be a hybrid version? I would say it's unlikely, definitely not going to be the same one as the Toyota RAV4 because they're very different kinds of vehicles, so it would need to be an entirely new system. Also keep in mind that the Toyota hybrid system does not seem to do well when it comes to towing and hauling, so it's unlikely that we're going to get that exact same system in the Tacoma. That's also why the hybrid system that we see in Ford's vehicles is very different in their efficiency focused vehicles versus their utility focused vehicles so escape fusion um, those hybrid systems are very different in design to what we see in the escape sorry the explorer hybrid the aviator hybrid and the upcoming f-150 hybrids which are are a, uh, a hybrid system that's a little bit more similar to bmw's hybrid system in terms of overall design now that hybrids can run on batteries only a good distance anyone experienced bad fuel when the engine is finally needed not exactly sure what you're asking there. Uh, maybe let us know down there in the comment section below. Uh, best tour SUV for taller people in our 60s like the Forester and Tour Trim. To comment on more luxury SUVs about this size or slightly larger. Um, if you're taller, you're probably going to want to look at something like a midsize SUV rather than a compact SUV. Um, especially in that... that um, that segment there. So the Forester's not bad as far as overall headroom goes. Something like the Sportage is a little tight. Um, be sure and pay a lot of attention to your overall headroom figures. Uh, and consider moving up to something like uh, the segment that has the Ford Edge in it because you're going to have overall better headroom. Uh, what do we think of the recent Acura MDX and TLX spy shots? I actually haven't seen them, so uh, hopefully I will take a look at those soon. Do you think they will up the horsepower of 2020 GLI and supercharge it? 
Probably not. Volkswagen doesn't seem to really be into superchargers. They seem to prefer turbochargers for overall efficiency's sake. I suspect it's probably going to stay right around there. Uh, why didn't GM use the CTS CT6 chassis on the their SUV rear-wheel drive bias? Uh, mainly, mainly money. That's the big answer there, Manny. So um, it was cheaper just to take the more uh, the the existing crossover platform that's already been crash tested, change the sheet metal that wouldn't affect its overall crash worthiness, and then create the XT6. Uh, what do we think about Skoda cars? <coughs> Pardon me here. <clears throat> um, translate your translate the thought of the appropriate Volkswagen, and there you have my thoughts on Skoda. Um, same goes for their other their other um, European brands like Seat, um, Volkswagen. For the rest of rest of our viewership that doesn't know, uh, in America, Volkswagen has a number of different brands internationally. Uh, Seat and Skoda being the two major ones in in Europe. Um, and they sell, for lack of a better word, uh, brand engineer, badge engineered uh, Volkswagen products. So the vast majority of their lineup is very closely related to either a foreign or current generation Volkswagen product. Um, if you liked a previous generation Volkswagen product and you're in Europe, you could probably find a new version of that uh, under one of those other brands for a little bit less. So there we go. All wheel drive Camry hybrid for 2020. Probably unlikely. We don't really seem to see any, any strong rumors on that one. 2019 Ford, uh, sorry, Kia Forte or 2020 Corolla SE 2 liter engine. Uh, I would probably take the Forte personally. I like its overall styling a little bit better and the roominess. The Corolla shrank a little bit in this generation. I have to say was a tiny bit disappointed, but the Corolla SE is going to be reliable. It's also going to have those active safety features standard, which is going to be a big deal. Uh, expected downsides of the upcoming 2020 Telluride. Uh, Andre, I would say the biggest downside of the Telluride is the fact that the second row seats don't let you leave a child seat latched into place to access the third row. So if you do have kids in child seats, especially forward face, pardon me, forward facing child seats, then it's going to be trickier to get folks into the third row than in something like a Volkswagen Atlas. I have to say I was a little bit disappointed in that because the Telluride is so big and it's a modern, it's the newest of the three row crossover set. Uh, and has the most interior room compared to its competition, but I was really surprised that they didn't uh, spend that extra time focusing on family friendliness there. Uh, so here, what do we think about the A-pillars in the Model 3? Rented one and found them hard to see around. I didn't find them to be too problematic, to be honest, no more than most modern vehicles. Uh, Mountain Hobo is saying, I checked out the Ridgeline, loved the comfort. One fatal flaw, though, the brake pedal rested against my uh, left shin bone and a crash would cripple me. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the emergency brake. Yeah, the emergency brake location in Honda's Pilot, uh, Passport, and the Ridgeline is in kind of an odd location there. Uh, I kind of wish they had gone to an electric parking brake. That might have helped that situation out. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Elliot saying here, considering a Lexus SUV, but find it uh, appalling. Small engine needs premium gas. And does the increased MPG warrant this if there's any? Um... I would check a little bit into that one. I It is my understanding with the Lexus SUVs and their small engines that uh, they will run safely and effectively on regular unleaded. Uh, I would have to double check on that one though. But the reality is that the vast majority of cars in America, including luxury brands, especially modern engine designs, will run safely on regular unleaded. They will just reduce the overall power output. So um, that applies for the vast majority of European cars. We always do our 0-60 to 60 testing here at Alex and Autos with the tank of fuel that the vehicle came on. Manufacturers do put the, whatever fuel uh, grade is recommended in those cars. But whenever we fill up a car here at Alex and Autos, we always put only regular unleaded in the vehicle uh, to see if there's really any difference uh, in the performance and drivability of the vehicle. And to be honest, over 10 years plus of doing this, we've never encountered a vehicle uh, that, that operates significantly differently on regular unleaded versus premium. Uh, the exceptions to that have been things like Volvo's R products previously, where there's definitely a different sound if you run it on regular unleaded because of the way that the timing has to be adjusted for regular. Uh, but every engine that we've tested uh, absolutely has run fine on regular unleaded so far. Let's see here. Blake is saying that uh, they have his own 300 and Kia products. The issue with rattling interior parts, maybe they've addressed it recently, um, but horrible interior creaks and rattles. That's good to know there. Uh, 
something like that may not necessarily show up in a reliability report because it's not true reliability problem, but that's that's handy to know. Uh, we haven't had any problems with our our uh, Kia Soul, but it doesn't have as many miles on it as it would if it was a gasoline vehicle, uh, since it is an EV and it's a short range one. Over three years, we have about 23,000 miles on it or so, so not a huge number of miles. Let's see here. Do you, uh, that link you posted in your channel, Model 3 Child Seat Review, not the X5 Review. Oh, whoops, sorry about that. Let me uh, get you the right uh, link there here. So let's post that link down there. Hopefully that is the correct link now. Uh, PHEV uh, that are out there, what are our top three picks, Candy Cane? That's an interesting question because there's so many different PHEVs out there um, and they're all over the map. Um, I would say the one that has impressed me the most, oddly enough, would be the Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid. Um, FC did a really good job with the plug-in hybrid system, and I hope that that hybrid makes its way into other vehicles in their lineup. No indications whether it will or not, or how long that will take, but it's just a very well-done hybrid system. The EV to hybrid interactions and, and transitions are very well done and very smoothly done. Uh, the regen braking is very, very aggressive because of the more powerful electric motors. And overall efficiency has been very good. So I'd say that's the one that's impressed me the most. Um, as far as um, plug-in hybrids, uh, generally speaking, I think the Hyundai Ioniq plug-in hybrid is absolutely excellent. Uh, the BMW plug-in hybrids also do very well because the, the trunk is, is, is integrated very nicely as far as maintaining cargo capacity um, and, and, and fit as well. Uh, with those vehicles. Their range is not as good as some of the others, but those have been uh, very good overall. Um, and then, uh, let's see here, the upcoming Ford Escape plug-in hybrid I do find quite interesting, so we'll see how well that performs in the real world. And then, of course, the, the new Lincoln plug-in hybrids are uh, exciting as well. So let's see here, is Honda going to get rid of the ZF transmission? The rumor mill says yes, but we don't know when. So uh, the rumor mill is also telling us that Honda probably had some sort of volume commitment with ZF that they had to shift a certain number of transmissions. So until that volume commitment is met, we will probably see what we do now, whether that's you know some vehicles using the six speed, some using the nine speed, or some using the nine speed, some using the 10. Um, we don't know exactly where that balance is going to, to sort out. That's why we see the 9 and 10 speed transmissions together in some vehicles, the 6 and the 9 speed in other vehicles, and then thankfully in the RDX, just the 10 speed. So we'll see how this is there. Uh, how terrible is the new infotainment system on the XF Sport Greg? Um, Jaguar's infotainment system definitely needs more polish, but I would say that we see the same level of polish in any manufacturer's uh, infotainment system that has a low volume. So this applies to Jaguar, Land Rover, this applies to Mazda. Um, I would say that this applies to Tesla actually as well, as far as infotainment design. Um, manufacturers that don't have a large amount of volume behind them, their systems are not going to be as fully featured, they're not going to be as well polished all the way around, and they tend to be a little bit buggier because when you consider, consider this, let's put it this way, all of the vehicles that Jaguar Land Rover builds together, everything that they build, um, is, is exceeded in sales by the Honda Civic in one quarter. So if there's a bug in the Honda Civic's infotainment system, Honda's going to find that really fast. And Jaguar Land Rover, it could take a long time before they really find the problem, really narrow it down, have a solution out there. Um... And it, this really also applies to Tesla systems. Now, thankfully, Tesla has their 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 rapid over-the-air update thing so they can try and fix some of these bugs, but you definitely see these sorts of bugs in the Tesla systems uh, when new when new models come out. Uh, so Model 3, when it first came out, etc. Now, now it's much more stable. But then on the flip side, you also see the lack of features in the Model 3, just like we see in some of those other companies. No CarPlay, no Android Auto, no AM radio, no Sirius XM radio. Um... And I think that's Tesla's narrowing down on the core features and trying to get them done. Um, whereas Jaguar Land Rover is trying to give you everything, but then some of the things get lost in, in the mix. So uh, that's my thought there. Uh, Bradford is saying that the Chevy Volt lease is up in a couple months. Should I buy it? It's been an excellent car so far. Uh, if you're looking at buying a car, uh, you know, lease deals sometimes are actually a good way of doing that. So if you're thinking, do I want it? Do I not want it? And you lease it and the lease deal's good. 
um, and the buyout price is fixed, um, then you know going that about it that route is a good way to do that because if you're gonna go out and buy another car, value wise that might not be as good as keeping your car, um, and you don't know what you're getting into. But if you like your car, then yeah, go ahead and keep it. Um, Let's see, is a Toyota Yaris IA a reliable car? So far it's been good, and I would actually say that the IA is an interesting uh, example of some of the variability that we see in car reliability metrics. The IA has been getting better reliability metrics than most Mazdas do, but it's still a Mazda being built by Mazda with Mazda engines, etc. So I don't know exactly what that means, other than it's perhaps that uh, Toyota shoppers are either more forgiving of the car in reliability metrics, or maybe they don't drive their cars as hard as the average Mazda shopper does. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but overall, it has been pretty good in reliability metrics. Uh, let's see here. Best current minivan to buy? I think we already answered that earlier in the video. Uh, better to drive Telluride or CX-9? I would say that the CX-9 is definitely more fun, but the CX-9 is also slower and doesn't feel as fresh as the Telluride. That's a pretty tricky one. Um, family of four, but two rear-facing car seats. I would say... Family friendliness, the CX-9 is going to allow you to keep those kids in the child seats and access the third row when they move into the forward-facing position. So not at the moment, but in the future, you'll be able to use that feature in the CX-9. It's just the one side. It's the passenger side of the vehicle. And the Telluride does not have that function at all. You, you have to scoot the seats all the way forward and then try and squeeze and shimmy past. But on the flip side, the Telluride is going to give you an awful lot more interior room than we find in the CX-9. It's probably going to be more reliable as well long-term versus the CX-9. Um, so that's a that's a hard choice, I would, I would say. Um, I like aspects of both. The CX-9 is going to be uh, the better uh, handling vehicle, not necessarily the faster vehicle, but the better handling one. Um, and it's gonna be a little bit more child seat friendly, but the Telluride is gonna give you a great deal more room on the inside, significantly more legroom than we find in the CX-9 overall. Um, and I think that the interior is overall a little bit fresher as well. See, so commuting 110 miles on the way to work, uh, Hyundai Ioniq, Kia Niro, or Hyundai Insight, which one has the more comfy seats? Uh, six foot tall. I would say, uh, that's an interesting, uh, one there. Um, the Ioniq and the Niro are very, very comparable in terms of overall comfort. I was disappointed, to be honest, with the Insight's seat comfort. Um, if you're doing a longer commute that way, I would say maybe you might want to look at the Honda Clarity. The Clarity is a little bit funkier looking, but I found the Clarity seats very comfortable, uh, and the Insight seats strangely not as comfortable. Um, uh, the Clarity plug-in hybrid is also going to be a really good option, I would say, because it's going to give you a portion of that commute electric only, so it's really going to improve your overall fuel consumption. Um... And I would also say, let's see here, 110 miles, one way to work. Um, you know, if you're looking at a fuel efficient vehicle, oddly enough, the Model 3 is actually going to be a really good good option there. Uh, the Model 3, one thing that it, it really did surprise me on that I hadn't expected, probably I would say the one thing that I didn't expect in the Model 3 was how comfortable the, the seats are. They really reminded me a lot of Infiniti seats and, and Nissan seats. Uh, let's see here, Michu, will sedans ever make a comeback? Probably not. Uh, it's not what we're seeing here. I think we're going to see a lot a, a more of a move to um, funky sedan-ish crossovers. We definitely see a lot of hatchbacky things, sedan -y, you know, sedan crossover widgets um, that are neither one nor the other. But I think the traditional box shape of the sedan, I think that's definitely dying. Um, why is there such a perceived or actual disconnect between Honda reliability and Acura reliability? Good question. There definitely seems to be a lot of a disconnect between reliability reality and reliability perception in general in the automotive industry. Uh, and that's always surprised me. And um, I would say maybe we can try and find a time to get somebody that, that's, that really has an in on reliability metrics maybe here on the show for something. Uh, Michael Crush at True Delta is an interesting person to talk to. Um, there definitely is a gap. A number of studies revealed this probably about 15, 20 years ago or so. Uh, so the data's old, mind you. But um, in, in independent studies, there's definitely a disconnect between reliability perception and reality when you look at deltas between the Japanese brands and American brands. Um, now, unquestionably, no matter what how you look at the metric, um, 
a, a Buick or a Ford or a Chrysler is going to be less reliable than a Toyota. But the perception gap is much larger than the reality gap. When you look at, at the metrics, your, your Ford might have one reliability problem more per two or three year window than the Toyota product. But in the consumer's mind, they think that the Ford is much less reliable than that compared to the Toyota. So there, there's unquestionably a gap, but the Delta is, is much smaller than a lot of folks realize. Um, so if we look, for instance, at uh, some of the, the least reliable brands in America, maybe it's Jaguar Land Rover or FCA's brands down there at the bottom, uh, the true difference between these two vehicles in terms of how often you will have a problem is not going to be enormous. Uh, you know, a lot of folks ask, for instance, you know, how has our Durango treated us? Again, this is a sample set of one, um, but so far we've had no reliability problems with the Durango. There has been um, one trim panel part that we didn't like the fitment of, but nothing has gone wrong with the Durango. Uh, but likewise, nothing's gone wrong with our soul. So, you know, who knows? Um, theoretically, over time, the Durango, I know, is going to have more reliability problems than something else. What those problems will be, I don't know yet. Uh, most likely, in that vehicle, it's going to be a electrical problem or a software problem. Uh, I have not experienced it, but uh, one of our other, one of our employees that's driven our Durango somewhere said that the infotainment system rebooted on them. That's the only real thing that we've noticed um, you know, uh, third party hearsay information on has been infotainment reliability. And when you look at the metrics, that is one of the areas where FCA's vehicles and Ford's and GM's vehicles perform below Honda and Toyota. But I would remind you that Toyota has only very recently implemented some of the smartphone integration features out there like CarPlay or Android Auto. Um, they've only recently explored, you know, uh, app integration where where apps are upgradable and interchangeable and that's something that the other manufacturers embraced more distantly so the more features you add to the car the more complex you make it the more unreliability you you are injecting into the product the more possibilities you are for that sort of thing um, so definitely keep that in mind let's see when do we expect dodge to redesign the journey i hope soon who knows uh that thing is really 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 old um, let's see, Jaguar F-Pace, uh, Range Rover Velar, Porsche McCann for liability and overall cost of ownership. Ooh, that's tricky. The F-Pace and the Velar are probably going to be identical, since they're nearly identical. Uh, the McCann has not necessarily been overly reliable. Porsche has good reliability metrics when you take a look at some of them, but remember that a lot of those reliability metrics are driven on miles, on, on years of ownership rather than actual miles. So on a mileage basis, remember that Porsches are not driven as much as a lot of the competition. And that really does affect overall reliability metrics for any of the boutique brands. So if you are looking at reliability in a, a Toyota or a Ford or a, a GM vehicle that's being driven 20, you know, 15 to 20,000 miles a year versus a Porsche that's being driven 3,000 miles a year, and then you look at problems per year, problems first three years of ownership, etc. You're always going to have a lower number in the car that's driven less. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind, especially considering that there are a lot of Porsches out there that are leased. So the luxury segment is very lease heavy, generally over 50% in a lot of these vehicles. And the more expensive the vehicle, the higher that lease percentage ends up being. Uh, so there are a lot of Porsche models out there. Uh, that are tailored for this. And Porsche is one of those car companies that will have leases that say, uh, you know, it could be a 5,000-mile lease a year, for instance. So maybe you'll have it for three years, but tops 15,000 miles. Definitely keep that in mind. Uh, so my bet would be they're probably going to be about equal. Jaguar is not the most reliable brand on earth. Porsche, there's there are those number disconnects. So I would say it's it, they're not going to be that far off. Let's see. Thoughts about the Honda CRV Hybrid? I hope we get it sometime soon. Any thoughts on when diesel engines may be back? Chrysler used to offer them. 
Uh, we finally, very recently, saw that they 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 struck a deal. FCA did to to account for the the inconsistencies in testing in their three liter diesel. FCA was really fighting tooth and nail about that one because they contend and they still contend that they did nothing wrong. Um, but they have finally struck a deal on how that's all getting sorted out. So I would expect it to be in the next six months or so. Now that that lawsuit has all been settled, they're probably going to buckle down on the compliance and testing for the new models. Um, let's see here. Do we think, Andrew's asking, do we think that Lexus will ever catch up with BMW in terms of creating attractive, fun-to-drive, mid-size SUVs? Um, I don't know. Remember that 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 Lexus doesn't necessarily sell on fun to drive. Um, Lexus dabbles with fun to drive now and then, but that's not the core of their mission. Um, and that's why RX outsells everybody else they're put together. So remember, think on this logically. If you're Lexus, why would you change the nature of the best-selling vehicle in that segment? Uh, one of the best-selling luxury vehicles in the world, really, period. Um, so RX sells well, sells well for that segment, sells well for luxury vehicles in general. Um, so if I were Lexus, I would just keep on doing what we've been doing and create another RX in the same style that the current one is. Um, so no, probably not. Let's put it that way. Um, let's see here. Uh, any thoughts and expected Model 3's long-term reliability? Uh, that's a good question. We don't necessarily know what long-term reliability is going to be on Tesla yet. Uh, we are getting some indications out of S and X now, because it has been long enough. Um, and it's a mixed bag. Um, if you take a look at, at some of those uh, rougher used S's out there, the, the taxi service ones, we're seeing battery pack replacements um, at around two to 300,000 miles, which is about expected. So that that's pretty good. As far as reliability, that's actually an excellent number. Um, if we look at some of the interior parts things, though, then we see a different story. Uh, there have been some recent articles out there about Model S and Model X touchscreens. Um, Elon decided that he wanted to use a, a, a non-automotive supplier part for that. So none of the automotive suppliers would give him a touchscreen that was what he wanted. So he chose a one that was an industrial rated screen. And that's not the same level of durability and reliability, especially for heat uh, acceptance as we see in the automotive world. So folks are having problems with color rendition, uh, delamination issues, uh, the uh, the adhesives leaking out of the screen, etc. And Toyota, or, and Tesla had been replacing a lot of those um, uh, for customers for free. And so they weren't showing up in, as complaint-wise as often as we're seeing now because Toyota re, or Tesla sorry, reason, recently changed their policy and they're no longer replacing the via, those screens out of warranty. So what does that bode for Model 3 reliability? We don't know yet because we don't really have a good handle on how they've sourced all the parts for the Model 3 yet. Um, but on the other hand, we do know that they've been producing a lot of electric motors. And regardless of how you feel about Tesla's business plan, um, unquestionably, they have a ton of electric motors out there, uh, really second only to Nissan. The Leaf is still the best-selling EV in the world. So Nissan has shipped a huge ton of electric motors um, in in vehicles that get driven a lot and all around the world in various conditions. So they have a lot of a lot of history with electric motors as well. Uh, but Tesla definitely has the more efficient motors. They're constantly innovating there. Um, and so I would assume that the basics of the vehicle are going to be just fine. Remember that there are less points of failure, generally speaking, in an electric vehicle. Um, some of the other components there, not sure, the fit and finish uh, is not necessarily a, a indicative of a true reliability problem. Just because panels don't fit well um, when the car comes off the assembly line doesn't mean they're going to fall off later. It just means they weren't put together with the same kind of precision. So hopefully that helps you out there. Uh, which car would we recommend for a new college grad out uh, the Yaris or the Hyundai Accent? Uh, use this car as a daily driver and for traveling. Um, that is a good question. Uh, ooh, Yaris or Accent? Um, the Yaris, the, the Mazda masquerading as a Toyota, um, I think is a good option there. That, that has proven to be a fun vehicle overall. Definitely more fun than the Hyundai Accent. The Accent is not the most compelling entry in that segment, I would say. If you're looking for something that's a little bit different, um, Depending on your exact budget and which version of these vehicles you're looking at, 
I would probably recommend trying to step up one category into the compact category. And if you're driving long distances, possibly look at a hybrid entry in that next category up uh, because you'll you'll uh, be able to get a few more features and a, few, a nicer interior. And then your long term operational costs will likely uh, balance out some of that that upgrade there. Let's see here. Moving right along. Did our Tesla get software locked? Uh, nope, Tesla is not software locked. There has been a lot of uh, conjecture about this. Um, we don't really know where where things are with Tesla on on that, um, or whether indeed it was just a rumor. So uh, nothing from Tesla out about software locking. I wouldn't believe it until Tesla themselves announces anything. Uh, remember that ours was sold as a standard range plus. The uh, window sticker has 240 miles of range on it. The car shows 240 miles of range, etc. It would have been uh, uh, flatly illegal for Tesla to sell a car with an incorrect window sticker on it. So unless they're going to try and revise the window sticker posthumously, I think it would be really difficult for them to try and adjust those models later. Uh, also, the VIN comes up as a standard range plus model. So that is a little bit tricky. Um, now, I'm sure... Tesla could try and work some legal magic out there, try and do something posthumously to try and, and adjust that. But at the moment, we just don't see that out of them. Uh, I would expect that more rationally, the less expensive model is just going to get canceled. That would that's that's what I would would assume. Um, the other thing is, you know, we don't see them, uh, you know, lock, blocking any of the features that were supposedly going to be blocked in that model. Uh, let's see here. Uh, GLI Autobahn, dual clutch versus Sport 2.0T, 10. Those are very different cars. One's a midsize stand and one is a compact stand, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, I think I like the Accord overall for its size and the overall feel of it, but the GLI is definitely fun, uh, and the dual clutch is definitely a little bit more sporty feeling. Uh, let's see here. What are our thoughts of the Volvo 2019-90 uh, series? I've always liked them. They're they're a nice, uh, nice comfortable option in that segment. Not going to be as sporty as the German options, but they march to a different drummer. Uh, let's see here. Do we compare? Com do we see or compare Consumer Reports vehicle reviews compared to our own views? They seem to be the go-to for a lot of uneducated car shoppers. I actually don't review very many of the competitive videos out there. To be perfectly honest. Um, I disagree sometimes with what Consumer Reports uh, puts out, but on the on the on the whole, I think I've been told that our our videos uh, tend to align with what they do. Um, I think that sometimes Consumer Reports can go off into the weeds when it comes to overall value um, and getting in the mind of a shopper. I think two classic examples of this are their thoughts on the Nissan Versa and the Toyota Prius C. Uh, the Prius C has been been discontinued, of course, um, but at the time when the Prius C was new. Um, I just think they didn't get it, uh, and the same thing with the Versa. Um, when you're talking about inexpensive vehicles in America, you have to remember that we're talking about a shopper that has decided they want a new car, and they don't have a lot of money to spend. So telling that shopper to go and buy something used really isn't being true to that, that segment and that shopper that's interested in, in a new car and a new car warranty. Um, and I think early on, they had some stumbles with hybrids and 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 um, folks that were there and, and getting into uh, really, really knowing what the hybrid shopper was after. So I'll just leave it at that, let's say. Uh, do we think Lexus will completely change the IS for the next generation? It's hard to tell. We haven't really seen too much there. Uh, let's see here. Did our standard range Model 3 revert back to without autopilot and stuff? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Model 3 does not have, did not have autopilot to begin with. So we added autopilot later for $3,000. But if you do buy the base model for the base model price, you will not get autopilot in it from the factory. So uh, it's not like anything so far. Nothing has reverted. Nothing changes. Uh, it, it you, you get it as it is. And if you want the extra features, you have to pay for them. Let's see here. Uh, do we think the new Escape will be contender for top SUVs? It looks really good, actually. I do like the Escape, especially the hybrid model. I think is going to be an excellent option in that segment. Uh, let's see here, do we think electric car conversions will go mainstream? I doubt it. There are too many um, variables to deal with with electric car conversions. There's a lot of effort, um, warranty reliability. You're putting an electric car platform in a vehicle that wasn't designed for it. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a huge deal really going forward. Uh, let's see here. Nissan Rogue Hybrid versus RAV4 Hybrid. Any thoughts? 
Uh, this is an interesting comparison. Uh, Rogue Hybrid is going to be better in, in traction situations. So if you're looking for something uh, that gets better fuel economy and you want better snow traction or mud traction, adverse weather traction, the Rogue Hybrid is going to be better because it has a mechanical all-wheel drive system. Now, the upcoming Ford Escape Hybrid is also going to have a mechanical all-wheel drive system, and I think in those situations, it's going to be my preference. Um, the design of the Rogue Hybrid system is a little different. Uh, it uses a traditional CVT, a belt and wheel CVT, and an electric motor and an engine. The Ford Escape Hybrid system is the same Ford Toyota Hybrid design that we've seen for some time, plus a mechanical all-wheel drive system, so it's probably going to give you better fuel economy than the Rogue, and that, that better traction. Uh, but we'll know when we see it. Let's see here. Volvo XC60, Infiniti QX50, or Acura RDX. Best drive for older people looking for comfort. I would probably go with either QX50 or QX6 or XC60. Either one of those, depending on your pricing level. If you want to look to spend a little bit more for some of those more advanced features, the XC60. Uh, if you're looking for comfort in lower end trim, the XC50, uh, QX50 is rather com uh, seats are very, very comfortable. Uh, someone's saying you take an XC40 over an XC60 any day. That's a tricky one. Depends on exactly what you're looking for. Uh, Enrique is asking what we think about Supra resale value. Oh, that's tricky. Resale value in Supras has been very good. Uh, whether or not that will translate into the new model, we don't know. It depends on how interested collectors are going to be into it long term. I think that's something that we won't know for probably about five or ten years yet. Uh, so here, durability on the 2.5 liter turbo i4 in Accord and Civic Type R. I think you mean the 2 liter turbo, uh, if, the, if you're thinking of the engine I'm thinking of here. Um, we don't know. It's a pretty new engine. Um, Honda has generally been very reliable. They have had a few stumbles lately, though. So their 1.5 liter turbo just had a recall. It doesn't seem to be a major issue recall. Um, but I think overall, it's probably going to be uh, fairly reliable. Let's put it this way. I would... I would bet that their reliability is going to be probably better than a lot of the European turbos uh, because they're producing so many more of them. But is it going to be as reliable as a Honda naturally aspirated engine? Probably not in the, the very long term. Let's see, JMac is asking who do we think makes the best and worst automatic transmissions? I would say at the moment it's unquestionably ZF for transmissions overall with the exception of the 9-speed front-wheel drive transmission. If we're looking for the best front-wheel drive transmissions at the moment, I think that's the new Honda 10-speed. Let's see, uh, review of the Hyundai Palisade, that is coming up in two weeks or so. That will be the second week of June, as I recall. Uh, let's see here, Honda Odyssey, blah, blah, blah. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey, for the shout out there. Uh, does the Model 3 have the lowest NVH in the economy sedan models? Um, no, I don't believe it does. If I recall correctly, I'm, I could be wrong on this one. I believe the Ionic is, is the quietest in that segment at the moment. Uh, the new Mazda 3 does fairly well, but I don't think it's actually the quietest there. Uh, what do we think of the new electric Mercedes SUV, the EQC, and how it stacks up against the Model X? Well, the first thing to know about the EQC is that it's not a Model X competitor. Um, it's going to be a Model Y competitor if when the Model Y actually comes out. So the e-tron, the i-pace, the EQC, they're all two-row electric vehicles, not three-row electric vehicles like the Model X is. Uh, so that's the that's the most important thing to keep in mind there, uh, and that's why the pricing does not seem to really align either. Um, the EQC looks interesting. We'll have to see how it performs in the real world. One thing that I have to say that I've been disappointed with uh, in this uh, this next subset of luxury EVs out there, uh, especially the e-tron and the i-pace, has been overall efficiency. Uh, they really have fallen behind uh, the Tesla Model Three and the Model X when it comes to overall efficiency. Now it's not too much, not too surprising that they're less efficient than a Model 3 because their crossover is the Model 3 is a sedan, but the Model X is frankly a whale. It's it's a huge, huge crossover. It's very heavy. It's a three-row vehicle. It's an older design, and yet it is still somehow more efficient uh, than this latest crop of luxury EVs out there. So that would be my big deal on those. Is um, if you're looking for that efficiency, the Tesla is going to be where you want to go. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. And it's not just the cost of operation, remember, when we're talking about efficiency. Um, and this is something that a lot of folks don't realize because the it does not translate well to a gasoline car experience. So if you're gonna if I say a BMW is 30% more efficient than the Audi, then you go, well, that's that's not too much of a problem. I don't care about a few dollars and cents here. Um 
and the range is not a problem because I go to the gas station, they both fill up in five minutes. What's the deal? Well, with an electric car, it, it takes a lot longer to fill up. And so this is definitely more of a deal. So an I Jaguar I-Pace, for instance, using this as an example versus the Model 3, not only is the same electricity going to get you uh, only 70% of the distance as a Model 3, it's going to take longer to fill that battery up. So um, when you plug the car in, an hour of charging is not going to get you as far. And then we have to factor in the fact that the Model 3 has a faster onboard charger. So not only is that same kilowatt hour that's taking you two hours to shove in the battery, not only are those kilowatt hours not going to get you as far as the as the Model 3, it's going to take you that, 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 that next factor longer to put them into the battery. So assuming you could charge at the vehicle's maximum rate, you're going to gain range considerably faster in the Model 3 than the I-Pace or the Model X versus the I-Pace. So that's my my one concern with those luxury EVs is that that on that level there's a competitiveness disadvantage that I really hope they address. Um, we see the closest competitiveness really I think in the the non-luxury segment. So the efficiency numbers out of the Leaf, the Nero, the Kona, the upcoming Soul EV, um, and actually the Bolt as well. They're a little bit closer. Um, but the charging speed is still a, a disconnect between these two segments. Now that can be explained away by the LEAF being significantly less expensive. If you qualify for all the tax incentives, a LEAF is really, really cheap. Uh, it's going to be 15 grand less than a Model 3. Um, but if you're looking at a Model 3 versus an I-PACE, that's a problem because the I-PACE is more expensive than the Model 3. So there we go. That's my thought there. Um, do we still think the Model 3 is the most efficient electric motor after our testing? Will the EPA ever revise Tesla claims? This is an interesting question. If you drive the Model 3 gently, then I, I'm pretty sure, and maybe we'll do a video on this, one, I don't know. But if you drive the Model 3 gently and you keep your speed 65 miles an hour or so, then yes, the Model 3 I think is unquestionably the most efficient in this category when it comes to motor efficiency. And that is the important thing to keep in mind. Um, remember that the models that we were testing out there for efficiency, we're testing the whole vehicle and we're trying to do more real world testing here. So we're driving the vehicles as I would say a, a shopper would drive the vehicles. So you're, we're not accelerating gently necessarily. We're having fun with it when we're driving out on these routes. Um, we're using the heater, which is an important factor and the Model 3 does not have a heat pump. So all of that is going to factor into the efficiency. Um, I think without a doubt, the Model 3 is impressively efficient. I would not be surprised, uh, and the numbers seem to bear that out, that the motor is probably the most efficient motor that we have in an electric vehicle right now. Um, and the range is very good. So um, I don't really find any of those numbers to be a problem. And as far as, uh, let's see here, will the EPA revise Tesla's claims? I doubt it, because I, I, I'm i sure that, that the numbers are right. Um, if you drive the Model 3 gently, you should get 240 miles. If you keep the heater off, um, you keep your speeds reasonable, etc., and you're driving on level ground, probably. Um, but if you drive as most folks do out there and you pass people on the freeway and you drive on uh, rural mountain roads that are a little bit more fun, uh, you take off from a stoplight a little bit more aggressively, then you will get below 240 miles of overall range and your efficiency is going to drop. It's just a factor. Um, it's also worth noting that that in some of these tests, um, especially when we're talking about more spirited driving, the Model 3 can consume more energy when you push the throttle pedal down than the other alternatives. That's going to cause the battery to drop a little bit faster. But again, as I think we were, we were pretty upfront in our Model 3 review, if you're after, if you're after the fun factor, you're not going to find that same fun factor in any of the competition. It's just not going to be the same. The, the immediacy of the throttle response, especially below 30 miles an hour, is simply unmatched in the Model 3. Um, and that's really where Tesla does an excellent job. I think this comes back to the it, intrinsic trouble of comparing a luxury vehicle to a non-luxury vehicle. And remember that the, the Model 3, despite what some folks might want to say, is solidly in the luxury category. Uh, that's not just the, um, uh, the brand positioning, which is an important factor that, the, that Tesla is a luxury brand. It has to do with the way the vehicle was designed, the, um, the size of the vehicle, the sportiness of the vehicle, the handling ability, etc. Uh, the feature set that we find for the price tag, etc. Um, and, and compared to the way 
that a 3 Series drives, the IS does very well there. And that's the kind of sportiness that we would expect in that category, but you don't expect out of a, a compact economy sedan or hatchback, let's put it that way. Uh, someone was asking why this video is in 480p. The 480p is because of some of the, the bandwidth problems that we've had here at home. We're doing this on a weekend, so I'm here at home, and uh, that's why the uh, 480p. Uh, hopefully none of you have been having bandwidth problems. I see some people here saying that they didn't see any problems there. Um, when are we going to review an F1 car? Probably never. That would be my guess there. Um, do we think the Ford is going to bring the Focus back in the U.S. just in the ST variant? It's very unlikely Ford has, has said that they don't sell well, so I don't see any rationale that they would bring that back, especially just for a low-volume variant. That would make the least sense, to be honest. Um, if Ford brought a Focus Hybrid back or a Focus EV back, that would probably make more sense than an ST, to be honest. Uh, do we think that Fiat will make improvements to the 2020 Spider? Um, I don't know. That is, the, that is an eternal question there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say probably not, because it is a lower volume car than the Mazda, um, but there is there is a possibility. We don't know. Uh, let's see here. Tesla comparison with e-tron and Mercedes EQC is a watch when you consider fit and finish, prestige and service. Uh, it is to some. Now, that, that, that's a tricky question, Dea. So, um, and uh, I have to say that the Model 3's fit and finish didn't really bother me as much as I thought it might. Um, Initially, it, it unquestionably is not put together very well, but as as you have probably noticed here at Alex and Autos, uh, fit and finish is not the biggest thing on my plate, as long as it's not egregious. Now that said, the Model X's fit and finish, that would bug me. Um, because the Model X and the, the, the Goldwing door things and the handles not lining, that would bug me. But the fit and finish problems that we see on the Model 3 are much more minor compared to that. And I don't think it would bother me on a daily basis. Um, to be perfectly honest, I would have kept the Model 3 if it had been a Model Y. Uh, if it had been a hatchback, we would have kept the Model 3 instead of getting the Nexo that's coming next weekend. Uh, the main reason for that is that the Soul EV, which is getting replaced by the Nexo, uh, is a company car. And so um, all of us in the office drive it. And it's a very group of people. And um, we really need the hatchback cargo carrying practicality. Even though the Model 3's cargo area was surprisingly large and accommodating, the hatchback functionality really is important to us to, to be able to fit larger items back there. And the Model Y just doesn't exist yet. Uh, it's also a lot more expensive, notably, than the Model 3. So definitely keep that in mind, too. Uh, let's see here. Uh, typical month, traveling, working hours, blah, blah, blah. So yes, yeah, so we're definitely a, an eight hour a day thing. So I go to the office just like everybody else does. Um, uh, my husband and I also own a materials engineering company. So, <coughs> pardon me. So I'm in an office with people that are not in the automotive world. They're in the world of, of scientific failure analysis. Um, and everybody... Let me rephrase this. So everybody drives the company vehicles. So um, the the new cup coming Nexo, the Rav4 hybrid long term test that we'll have. Uh, everybody gets a chance to whirl around those. So we get to find opinions from people that are not automotive people, not car people. Um, I find that particularly helpful. Uh, I have a full time editor, the editor, my editor, uh, whose name is also Alex. Interestingly enough, she is in the office uh, eight hours a day, five days a week as well. Uh, travel, there's a lot of travel, but uh, it, it comes in waves. So earlier this year, you may recall, there has been a lot of travel there. Um, this month, there are only two trips, thank goodness. Uh, and then June, I think there are only going to be two trips. Um, but it does vary, so it comes and comes and goes. So that's how that works. Uh, we usually have uh, at least two cars in the office at any one time for review. So this week, we have the Volkswagen Golf base model with the 1.4 liter turbo and the manual transmission. And then we have a Honda Passport, uh, both in for review. And then coming up next week, we have a, I can find out for you here. I believe it is something from Toyota. And let's see, we'll pull up our numbers here. So next week we have the Land Rover, oh sorry, we have the Mercedes-Benz A220, uh, something that a lot of folks have been asking for, and we have the RAV4 XSE Hybrid, 
Uh, so we'll do a full review on the XSE Hybrid. Our long-term model should come up in about a month. We had to order it, so hopefully it's on a boat somewhere. We don't really know. And then we'll have that Mercedes-Benz A220. Then we'll have the Land Rover Discovery. Um, and then we're going to probably have a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. Um, I know that many of you may be disappointed by this, but I'm actually trying to get the G-Wagon off of the list and get it replaced by a different Mercedes model. I really want the E-Class, not the G-Wagon. But somehow when I called up Mercedes and I said I really want the E-Class, they said, hey, how about a G-Wagon? And then put that on the schedule without, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, it's a complicated thing. So um, hopefully the G-Wagon will turn into an E-Class because I'm more interested in the E than a G. So there we go. Um, let's see, how are we still streaming? Uh, our S 2013 85 75% not too bad. Okay, there we go. Uh, do we think the crossover trend will end? I don't think so. I think that we're just seeing a, a shift in in practicality of vehicles. Cars becoming uh, more utilitarian than ever before. When you think about it, um, it, it is interesting in a way that we went from arguably more practical vehicles uh, in the olden days, uh, very square form factor vehicles, not unlike modern crossovers to the sedan format where we have uh you know two somewhat triangular windows and an actual trunk and a a, uh, a hood not a terribly practical overall shape um and now we're moving towards a a general shape in vehicles that is far more practical and utilitarian um so i don't really see that changing much i think that the only thing that could possibly change this trend would be uh, more expensive gasoline because uh, unless fuel economy standards drastically improve or gasoline becomes drastically more expensive, I don't think consumer buying habits are going to change much. Moving along here, will the 2020 Forester get the same turbo engine as the 2020 Outback? I haven't heard any details on that. But I would say it probably won't. Could be wrong here, but I would say probably won't. And the reason would primarily be the claimed sales on the previous Forester XT. Subaru claimed that the previous model uh, was only about a 4% take rate and that they sold more manual transmissions. Their, their manual transmission take rate was higher than the turbo engine. Not totally sure if I buy that on the Subaru front, but I think the real reason here is that uh, it would affect their corporate average fuel economy numbers. Remember that, that CAFE, as it's called in the United States, is a huge factor when designing new cars and new model variants. So Subaru, being a manufacturer that has all-wheel drive in every model except for their sports car, um, that's a, that puts them at a competitive disadvantage when it comes to fuel economy because they don't have more efficient front-wheel drive models to offset the, offset the lower efficiency in their all-wheel drive models like we see at the other car companies. Um, so that would actually disincentivize Subaru from creating those models. Um, the Outback and the Legacy, the turbocharged engine is replacing the six-cylinder engine. So that's going to get better fuel economy than the six-cylinder did in their CAFE tests. That's why we see it there. I don't know if, uh, if they're going to have any real incentive and drive to put it in anything smaller or less expensive. Let's put it that way. Uh... Forrester and talks to join Renault. I'll believe that when I see it. Who knows? There are lots of talks all the way around. Do we think the MR2 will return to the U.S. market as an EV? Uh, there was someone asking that question at the Supra launch event, and the Toyota people really seemed to say no, that they didn't think that the MR2 would ever return unless there was some manufacturer to partner with uh, in its return. Uh, have we had any experience with Tesla's Navigate on Autopilot? Yes. Um, I wouldn't say that my experiences were quite as drastic as what we saw out of Consumer Reports this last week, but I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan, and I have to say that in my head I don't see the point of Navigate on Autopilot if your hands are supposed to still be on the wheel. So uh, there are those two conflicting things. Uh, navigate on Super Cruise, in my head, would make more sense than Navigate on Autopilot, but we don't see that there yet. Um, Let's see your Prius best car so far, Prius Prime 140 MPG. Uh, I mean, it depends on how you look at the MPG scale. So uh, remember when we're taking a look at those plug-in hybrids and the mile per gallon numbers are being calculated without factoring in uh, the, the energy used for the electricity, 
those numbers are tricky. So when you're comparing fuel economy numbers in a plug-in hybrid like a Volt, especially uh, the way that they compare their fuel economy numbers versus something like a Pacifica hybrid, they're comparing their they're computing fuel economy very very differently. So you can't really compare those numbers. Um, with the Pacifica hybrid, for instance, you could be running electric only all the time, and the fuel economy average is going to show you somewhere between. 60 and maybe 65 mpg that's because fca uses a calculation method where they're trying to give you a fuel economy score for the electricity consumed but if you were driving a chevy volt and you were doing the same thing and you had never used your gasoline then it would be giving you 250 plus mpg on its fuel economy score so keep that in mind these numbers are not really comparable um so that's the important thing to keep in mind with those MPG numbers. Um, cost of operation is one thing. The MPG score and trying to compare it, that's something different. So it's difficult to do, to do those comparisons between vehicles when the, when the calculation method is different that way. Let's put it that way. Uh, RAV4 Adventure or CX-5 Turbo. Uh, if you don't care about extra luggage space. Um, I, well, the Adventure is going to be more off-road capable. Uh, it has that that uh, mechanical effect of limited slip differential in the rear. CX-5 Turbo is definitely going to be the faster one. It is considerably faster. Uh, Tully's asking if Buick will continue to produce sedans in the U.S. I don't know. We don't know what the future is for Buick now that Opel is dead. Uh, well, Opel is dead to GM. Um, will they be bringing some Chinese models into the U.S.? We don't know. Uh, we have the Envision coming from China. Um, will they be trying to redo sedans from other areas of the business we, we just don't know yet um in a in a hopeful world i would hope that maybe they tie in with cadillac and bring us a discount version of the rear wheel drive sedan lineup but i think that is probably the longest shot that we could hope for so with all of that uh out of the way i think that we have to time just for one last question because i'm supposed to be somewhere at three o'clock and i think i'm going to be late so won't the subaru 2.4 and the outback be less reliable than the boxer six um it's hard to say. Turbocharged engine versus naturally aspirated engine reliability is a tricky one. Um, generally speaking, yes. Turbocharged engines theoretically should be less reliable simply because there are, are more parts involved. Now, that said, um, the Subaru Horizontal 6, Horizontally Post 6 engine wasn't exactly the most reliable engine in the world um, because it also has more parts than an inline 6. Uh, or some of the VR engines, etc., cetera, um, and definitely more parts than a straight four, for instance. So if we were comparing an inline four turbocharged engine to a horizontally opposed six, then I would say it might be about even. But a horizontally opposed four that's turbocharged versus a, an H6, um, H6 might be more reliable long term. A lot of variables, though. It depends on the overall design. Um, turbochargers have gotten a lot more reliable. The turbo itself will easily last more than 200,000 miles, so definitely keep that in mind. Uh, in the average ownership experience, I am not concerned at all about turbocharged ownership. Um, again, sample set of one, which I really dislike here, but um, the Volvo that I bought almost 20 years ago, no, about 20 years ago, actually, is now on its third owner, uh, family friends bought it and then their son has it, etc. It's moved on down the line with the family friends. Uh, that Volvo went to its grave with 290,000, 300,000 miles on it and the original turbo and the original clutch. So go figure. Um, turbos will last a very, very long time. Admittedly, the turbo sounded a little funny later in its life. Uh, when you turn the engine off, you can hear the bearings but it still was soldiering right along at, at about 300,000 miles. So uh, with all that out of the way, uh, hope everybody got their questions answered and uh, be sure and sound off uh, probably over at facebook.com slash Alex and Autos. Tell us whether you like this show being on Saturday or Sunday or a Friday evening. We may be able to try this uh, on weekends here. We'll have to upgrade our internet connection uh, in order to make that possible. But uh, let me know down there in the comment section below or over at facebook.com slash Alex and Autos. I will see all of you later.